Every summer, I have the distinct pleasure of spending an entire month with people from all over the world here in Dallas, teaching the Arabic language, Quranic Arabic, the language of the Quran, and discussing and exploring the timeless lessons and wisdoms of the Book of Allah. We call this experience Quran Intensive. Please check out BayinaSummer.com. That's B A Y Y I N A H Summer.com to get more information and sign up. I look forward to seeing you here, inshallah, at the Quran Intensive. A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajeem. ثم انشانا من بعدهم قرنا اخرين فارسلنا فيهم رسولا منهم ان اعبدوا الله ما لكم من اله غيره افلا تتقون وقال الملا من قومه الذين كفروا وكذبوا بلقاء الاخره واترفناهم في الحياه الدنيا ما هذا الا بشر مثلكم ياكل مما تاكلون منه ويشرب مما تشربون ولا ان اطعتم بشرا مثلكم انكم اذا لخاسرون ايعدكم انكم اذا متم وكنتم ترابا وعظاما أَإِذَا مِتُّمْ إِذَا مِتُّمْ وَكُنْتُمْ تُرَابًا وَعِظَامًا أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرَجُونَ هَيْهَاتَ هَيْهَاتَ لِمَا تُوعَدُونَ إِنْ هِيَ إِلَّا حَيَاتُنَا الدُّنْيَا نَمُوتُ وَنَحْيَا وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا رَجُلٌ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا وَمَا نَحْنُ لَهُ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ قَالَ رَبِّ انْصُرْنِي بِمَا كَذَّبُونِ قَالَ عَمَّا قَلِيلٌ لَّيُصْبِحُنَّ نَادِمِينَ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ بِالْحَقِّ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ غُثَاءً فبعدا للقوم الظالمين <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبه للمتقين والصلاه والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين so in the previous uh, session Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we discussed uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us about uh, Nuh عليه السلام and his dealing with his people and his interaction with his people Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 31, He says, ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَنْشَأْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ قَرْنًا آخَرِينَ Now, ثُمَّ in the Arabic language, as we've talked about before, ثُمَّ لِلْتَرَاخِي It basically talks about what comes next. It's not just to generally collect a group of things, but it's specifically establishing sequence between things. So Allah says then we raised and we talked about the meaning of insha it doesn't just mean to create but it means to bring forth to kind of raise up then we raised up after them and this is another indication of the fact that Allah is establishing sequence here that then after them we brought up we brought forth qarnan akhirin qarnan akhirin um so a very brief translation then we raised another generation after them So a couple of things here before we act uh, the word qadn let's go ahead and discuss a little bit about the meaning of the word qadn there's a lot of different discussion by the uh, scholars of the language and even the mufassirun uh, what does the word qadn exactly mean now in modern arabic we're usually used to the translation of generation and while that's not incorrect i thought i'd also share a little bit of a classical perspective in regards to the word qadn uh, abu ishaq he says al qadnu thamanuna sana it's 80 years Uh, some other scholars of the language say sab'una sanatan it's 70 years and you can kind of see where those numbers are coming from because they're basing it off of a generation as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said a'maru ummati ma bayna 60 wa 70 the average age of my ummah is between 60 and 70 so that's kind of where these numbers are coming from some say however qadn can refer to any duration of time um azhari another one of the scholars of the language he says that uh Classically speaking especially in the Quranic language qarn refers to a generation of people every group of people that a prophet or a, a prophet was sent to that they are referred to as qarn 
The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he uses the word qadni in a very famous uh, and authentic narration where he says, خَيْرُ الْقُرُونِ qadni." That the best of, no, normally again we translate, the best of generations is my generation. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ And those who come after them and those who come after them. And typically that's explained as the tabi'oon and the atba'u tabi'een. Um, so that would again refer to kind of the meaning of uh, generation. And overall, um, some of the mufassirun also say that generally speaking, the ulama of the language referred to uh, do uh, generally, generally agree on the fact that qadn at the most refers to a century. But overall, it does seem very accurate that in the Quranic language, in the classical language, the word qadn is used more so when talking about a generation, a group of people. Um, and of course, as we already know, um, this will conclude by talking about these people being destroyed. So that again, that meaning is confirmed that it was a generation of people um, who met their end, who met their demise. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says very briefly again, very roughly translating, that then after them, after the people of Nuh, we brought forth, we raised up another generation, another generation. Now, who is this exactly talking about? Because as we're going to explore, as we go through the coming ayat, كَفَرُوا And so on and so forth. As we read through the ayat, one thing that we're going to observe and notice is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not identify who these people are. Like Allah does not specifically mention the name of these people. So there is some discussion amongst the mufassirun as to who is this referring to, who is this alluding to. So there are a variety of different opinions. Um, Zamakhshari, um, one of the early commentators on the Qur'an, uh, particularly his analysis from a linguistic perspective is always very valued. He says that they are the people of Ad, hum qawmu Adin, a qawmu Hud. That these are the people known as Ad, they were the people that Hud alayhi salam was sent to. And he does attribute this particular opinion to Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, even though that the attributing that opinion to him is not fully authenticated. But nevertheless, there is an opinion that this refers to the people of Ad. Now, I'd like to go ahead and kind of mention what gives kind of each opinion a little bit of validity in terms of analysis. So one of the things that does work to the um, benefit of this particular opinion, one of the evidences for this opinion, is that typically throughout the Qur'an, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the perished nations, the nations that were destroyed, the groups of people that were destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the people of Ad, the, to whom Hud alayhi salam was sent, are typically mentioned and talked about after the people of Nuh alayhi salam. We see that in Surah Al-A'raf, we see that in Surah Hud itself, right? That, that's usually the mention that follows. And in fact, because of, and he's really kind of keying in on the usage of Thumma and Min Ba'dihim. See, because Ba'dahum means after them. And that could mean at any point in time after them. We came after them, Ba'dahum. But whenever the, the preposition, the Sila of Min is added to Ba'd, Min Ba'dihim, it means right after them. Um, and in Surah Al-A'raf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically talking about the people of Ad, says that they are the people who came, Khala'ifa, uh, that they are the ones who came right after, they were the first ones to come after the people of Nuh alayhi salam. So that is what gives this particular position some credence. Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimullahu ta'ala, along with what seems to be um, a majority of the scholars of tafsir, um, are of the opinion that no, this, these group of, this group of people that's being talked about here, these individuals, this, these people, are actually the people of Thamud, to whom Salih alayhi salam was sent. And the evidence that they use for this particular opinion, and I'm kind of going forward here, um, and just to give you an ayah number so you can refer to that. In ayah number 41, here in this passage, in ayah number 41, the last ayah I recited, um, in ayah number 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the end of these people. How these people were destroyed that Allah is talking about, these nameless people in this particular passage. And Allah mentions their form of punishment, He calls it as sayha as sayha kind of like a loud scream or a loud bang, like almost like an explosion uh, of sound more specifically. 
And where the connection there is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, in Surah Hud, ayah number 67, in Surah 11, ayah 67, Allah says, وَأَخَذَ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا الصَّيْحَةَ When talking about the people of Thamud, Allah refers to their form of punishment as الصَّيْحَة. And that's the same exact word that's used here in this passage. So they're making that Qur'anic correlation and saying that based off of that, we can um, identify these people as the people of Thamud. Now those are the two, uh, generally the two opinions that are given. However, I'll go ahead and comment on this here, even though there will be other little um, nuances that I'll point, I'll, I'll point out as we progress through the passage, that at the same time, so there's, there's two ways to look at this. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not name them here. That is the fact. So there has to be some wisdom in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not naming them here. When Allah names always the, the, uh, the qawm that Allah is talking about in all the different places in the Qur'an, Allah does not name them here. So there has to be a wisdom and a hikmah to that. Um, and so, now on one side you could say that, well, they're not named here because other places in the Qur'an shed light on that fact. Right? Qur'anic correlation. That the Qur'an was meant to be studied completely and holistically. That there are uh, references to these people other places in the Qur'an. But at the same time, and this is where some of the commentators on the Qur'an who particularly pay attention to kind of the flow and the thematic and the, the thematic structure of the Qur'an and the surahs and the ayat and the passages, they uh, prefer to kind of comment by saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not identify them. Um, and if you really pay attention to all the nuances, you can make almost an argument for the people of, the, the people of Ad or the people of Thamud. And where that basically leaves you is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not identifying them, but this is more of a general description that's being given here, that this predicament existed time and time again. Throughout time, this predicament has, has existed. That for the following reasons as we're going to go through them, that the, a prophet was sent to a people, the, pro, the message of the prophets had a lot of consistency to it, as we've talked about before. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهَ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ That we never sent a messenger except that we inspired to them, we told them to tell the people that there is absolutely positively nothing and no one worthy of worship except for Allah. And so serve only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enslave yourself to Allah. Worship only Allah. So the message of the prophets was very consistent might differ in a, in a few ahkam here and there, but the core of the message was always consistent. And unfortunately, a lot of times there was a very similar type of reaction. That reaction was due to a number of different causes and reasons that are going to be mentioned in this particular passage. And unfortunately, because of those reasons, they took a particular attitude towards the Prophet and his message. And very unfortunately, to their own detriment, whenever they took that attitude and approach towards that Prophet and his message, that they ended up meeting their end in this manner or fashion. So it's more of a general lesson here. And again, kind of we've been talking about, um, when the brothers also reminded me, that kind of talking about the flow and the consistency of the surah, that this is a warning to both the believers and disbelievers, particularly at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh, the Meccans, that look, people before you came, who adopted an attitude the way you are, the, the attitude that you have towards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and the Qur'an and his call and his mission. And unfortunately, this is how they met their end. This is what transpired with them. This is what happened with them. So fix your ways, repair your ways before you end up meeting a similar fate. And the believers are being consoled through that, that like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the previous passage, and we talked about this, that ultimately, وَالْعَاقِبَةُ muttaqin. That at the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants His victory to those who stay devoted and dedicated to Allah and to the cause. And in mentioning kind of a very general analysis of such a situation, it's basically presenting this, that this is not something specific that transpired with the people of Nur. That because at the same time, if you tell the people that, look, the people of Nur came before us, uh, before you, before us, and this is the way that they behaved and they acted and they responded and this is what happened with them, then somebody can brush it off to say, well, that was just the people of Nuh. 
Well, then before us came the people of Ad, and they acted this way. Well, that was just the people of Ad. Well, the people of Nuh, this was the problem. The people of Ad, it was their physical size and dominance and strength. And the people of Thamud, it was this. And the people of Madian, it was this. And the people of Lut, it was this. And there's always going to be some type of excuse. You're going to basically pinpoint it on one particular reason or cause. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents a very general analysis saying, no, no, no. There are some very um, general problems. There are some, some of these generic issues that you'll find amongst you as well. That you're afflicted with them as well. And this leads to this type of an end. So there's this profound wisdom in this. So even leaving it very general and um, not ambiguous, that's not a good word to use in regards to the Qur'an. But just leaving it as a more general analysis, um, there is great benefit in that as well. So we don't have to absolutely precisely pinpoint and try to guess who Allah is talking about, but rather pay attention to what Allah is calling our attention to. And that is the lessons and uh, what there is to learn from the, the, the conversation and the interaction. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, <clears throat> In the next ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 32, فَأَرْسَلْنَا فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِّنِ اللَّهِ غَيْرُهُ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ A very brief translation. And so we sent one of their own, as among, we sent one of their own amongst them as a messenger, telling them to serve God for He is your only God. Will you not heed him? Will you not then be God fearing and God conscious? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Fa arsalna fihim. Now a lot of these words and even the construction of the words we've gone through in the previous passage, so it will require a lot of um, analysis on our part. But there is one thing that jumps out right away here. Allah says, Fa arsalna. The verb, the fi'al arsalna is being used, which means to dispatch, to, di- to send, right? To send a messenger, to send a prophet, to send someone with a mission and a message. Now, normally whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sending a prophet or a messenger, the preposition, the sila, the preposition for the verb, for the fi'al, that is used is ila. Wa ila adin. Farsalna ila. Wa laqad arsalna nuhan ila qawmihi. Right? So usually the preposition, the sila of ila is used. Here Allah uses the preposition of fi. Farsalna fi him. Instead of ilayhim, we sent to them, Allah is saying we sent amongst them. So what exactly is the difference here? Now, I'm going to say this, but then I'll have a follow-up in regards to that. If you're just trying to extract the gist of it, the gist is basically the same. That Allah is saying that Allah sent a prophet to the people, amongst the people. So where He says He sent them to the people, He's saying He sent the Prophet amongst the people. And where he's saying he sent the Prophet amongst the people, saying meaning he sent them to him. To them, excuse me. So the gist is basically the same. But nevertheless, there is of course a nuance to why Allah mentions the word fee. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already many places in the Quran, including here, he says, Rasula minhum. And I talked about this in the previous session, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly throughout the Quran points out the fact that the prophets and the messengers who were sent to people to preach to them, to call them to Allah, were from amongst them. And that gave them an element of relatability. And that allowed them to connect to the people and speak to the people on a more personal level. Um, but at the same time, there's another now dynamic, there's another, there's another dimension here. And the other dynamic is that, okay, fine. And this is something we'll be able to kind of understand from maybe our communal experiences. So let's just say that there's an individual who is from amongst the people. Grew up in the neighborhood, played in the streets, family and friends, community, right? Is from the community. Now, I'm going to use a, 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 a more contemporary example in our communities. And now let's just say that this individual, man or woman, regardless, ends up studying... Um, you know, the dean for an extended period of time travels the world, goes around, sits, you know, with the greatest scholars in the world and acquires a lot of knowledge, is gone for an entire decade and comes back with, you know, a great amount of knowledge and benefits. Now a lot of times, there's another predicament, there's another dynamic. 
fine, that person might be from amongst the people, but will that person come back and be among the people? Right? Are they still going to be, are they still going to adopt while still, of course, living up to whatever ambitions and goals and spiritual ambitions that they might have, right? Responsibilities that they have, actually. But still, are they still going to be amongst the people? Like the Messenger of Allah Muhammad wasallam was, right? He would pray with the people. He would sit down after, oh, I talked about this before, after Salat al-Fajr would turn around, just sit there casually on the ground and converse and talk to the people. The Prophet ﷺ, sometimes he would come out kind of early for Salat al-Fajr, and there was still some time, and people were given some time to arrive at the masjid and get ready for prayer. And the Prophet ﷺ would pray the two raka'ah, the sunnah before the Fajr prayer. And a lot of times he would just lie down, right there in the masjid, just lie down. Just to kind of stretch out his back, just to rest himself, particularly in his later years. Right? And that's very casual, very common behavior. The Prophet ﷺ would sit on the ground, like we, I talked about before as well, sit on the ground and eat with the people. He would share his food with people. He would welcome, you know, he had an open door policy, welcome the people into his home. He would go and visit the people at their homes. He would sometimes sit outside the masjid on the side of the street, just kind of waving and saying salam to people as they pass by. Children would, be, would feel very comfortable to kind of come up to him and talk to him and sit in his lap. In fact, one of my teachers, this is going to sound very odd, though, and I'm going to try to say it so that it doesn't sound odd, it's on me. But one of our very senior hadith teachers, he was actually pointing out the fact that there are a number of different children, I forgot what the exact number he had mentioned, six or seven. There are six or seven children, babies, not only his own children or grandchildren, but six or seven different babies who ended up urinating on the Prophet wasallam. And what that meant was that he was just such a man of the people that if a little baby came, you know, somebody brought their baby with them to the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ would scoop the baby up, play with the kid. One time the Prophet ﷺ, he had a practice that after the Dhuhr prayer, a lot of times he would go and he, was, he would visit family members. You know, just to make sure Salat al-Rahim and kind of keep up with the different family members. And one of those family members was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Abbas. Ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu. And so he goes to the home of Abbas, and the wife of Abbas, her name was Umm al-Fadl radiallahu anha. And one of the grandchildren, one of their grandchildren, was there in the home kind of playing. And the Prophet sallallahu kind of went there, and it's Zahira, right? It's after the Dhuhr time. And you see how it is outside here after the Dhuhr time? So it was really hot. And so the Prophet ﷺ went and just to kind of relax and cool down while he's kind of talking to the family. How's everybody doing? How's, everybody, how's everything going? Um, checking up on everybody, he kind of laid down. And as he laid down, there was a little infant, toddler, kind of crawling around and crawled up to the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ picked up the child and started kind of bouncing him on his chest, like you do with a baby, with a child. And the baby got a little too excited and urinated um, and they got on the shirt of the Prophet ﷺ. And Umm al-Fadl freaked out. Now obviously, this is the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. Anybody, you'd be like so embarrassed. This is Muhammad Rasulullah ﷺ. He just came from the masjid. He has to go back to the masjid and lead prayer. And here your kid just, you know, peed all over him. So she freaked out. And she came and she took the child and the Prophet said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, relax, it's all right. Go ahead and change him out, whatever you got to do. And the Prophet, and she said, let me wash your shirt, let me clean your shirt. He said, no, relax, I can do it myself. And the Prophet got up and went out to the water, took off his shirt and he washed his shirt, kind of, you know, and then he put it back on. And then he came and sat down again, took the baby in his lap again. And so, you are from amongst the people, but now that you've been given this you know, this mission and this status and this knowledge and prestige, very honestly, will you remain amongst the people? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just through the changing of this little preposition, teaches us such a profound lesson that these messengers, not, these prophets were not only from the people and sent to preach to the people. You know, a lot of times they say, are you talking, uh, are you talking to someone or are you talking at someone? Right? Are you talking with someone? That's another whole other level. 
where you might have to actually get quiet and listen to what they have to say. And that's one of the attributes of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was an amazing listener. And so this is pointing it out. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala drops this a few places within the Qur'an. Um, for instance, I'll just quote a few of the ayats where Allah mentions this in surah number 13, ayah number 30. Surah Turad, كَذَلِكَ أَرْسَلْنَاكَ fi ummatin. We didn't just send you to the people, we sent you amongst the people. In Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 94, Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا fi qaryatim." That whenever we sent a prophet amongst the town. And of course here in Surah Al-Mu'minun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَرْسَلْنَا فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا In Surah Al-Furqan, Surah number 25, ayah 51, وَلَوْ شِئْنَا لَبَعَتْنَا فِي كُلِّ قَرْيَةٍ نَذِيرًا Allah talks about sending a prophet and a warner amongst every town and every group of people. So being from the people, going to the people, and then learning to live amongst them. Because that's the only way that your message and your da'wah, your preaching, is really going to be effective. فَأَرْسَلْنَا فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ أَنِ عَبُدُ اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَهٍ غَيْلُهُ أَفَلَا تَتَّقُمْ the next ayah, ayah number 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا وَكَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَأَتْرَفْنَاهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ يَأْكُلُ مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ مِنْهُ وَيَشْرَبُ مِمَّا تَشْرَبُونَ A very brief translation. But the leading disbelievers among his people who denied the meeting in the hereafter, to whom we had granted ease and plenty in this life, said, he is just a mortal like you, he eats what you eat and drinks what you drink. This is a very brief translation. Now we've, again, covered some of this language here, the word malat, we talked about it, means like the elite amongst the people. There's one very significant, uh, there's one very interesting, rather, nuance here in terms of language. If you go back to, so we are reading ayah number 33 right now, if you go back to ayah number 24, so I'll give everybody an opportunity to go back to ayah number 24, and look at the ayah, Allah over there said, فَقَالَ الْمَلَاءُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ فَقَالَ الْمَلَاءُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ That the elite, the elite, those who had disbelieved from his people, the people of Nuh. The elite who had disbelieved from the people of Nuh. Here in ayah number 33, Allah is saying, وَقَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا And the elite from his people who had disbelieved. The elite who had disbelieved from the people. And now it's saying that the elite from the people who had disbelieved. Now, if it's not clear in translation, I'll explain here, that الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا the key thing here is those who disbelieve, the disbelief. In the previous ayah, ayah number 24 that I'm referencing, the disbelief was attributed to the elite. So as to say that amongst, there were the people of Nuh, and the elite amongst them had decided to disbelieve. And that's why we see the conversation in Surah Hud, another place in the Qur'an, Surah 11, that they're specifically saying, مَا نَرَاكَ تَبَعَكَ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ هُمْ أَرَاذِلُونَ that we find that the only people that actually listen to you or follow you are the lowly amongst us, the filthy, the trash, the street people amongst us. So that ayah, just a subtle little nuance, just a switch of a few words, tells you that there were believers amongst the people of Nuh, and we talked about the opinion of Ibn Abbas, that there were 80 some odd people along with Nuh alayhi salam. Even if you exclude the family, immediate family members, there were 70 some odd people from amongst his people. Might not be a huge group of people, but still, there were some of his people who were with him on the ark, who believed with him. And that's why you see them being talked about in the conversation. When you and those who are with you have boarded the ship, and the elites are referring to them, your followers are just the, st the street people, the trash from amongst us, so on and so forth. But this ayah, ayah number 33 is telling you that there were at the same time other prophets that dealt with um, what could be described as a different type of difficulty and predicament. Right? And that predicament was, وَقَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِهِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا That the 
the quality or the action, the attribute of disbelieving, disbelief, is attributed to the whole people. And this basically gives you the idea that very few to know, very few to know people believed from amongst the people of some of the prophets. And the Prophet ﷺ talks about this, that on the day of judgment, some prophets will come and they'll have maybe a thousand or so believers. Some prophets will come, they'll have a hundred or so believers. Some prophets will come, they'll have a few dozen believers. Some prophets will come, they will have three, two, one, and some prophets will come and they will have no believers. No believers. Right? So think about the challenge and the difficulty faced by those prophets. Again, it gives you that level of appreciation. So this is a little linguistic nuance within the Qur'an. And again, when you pay attention, you're able to kind of pick up on this. So the elites from amongst the people of this prophet, who had all disbelieved, وَكَذَّبُوا Now here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to talk about exactly what led to their disbelief. What were some of their traits and qualities? وَكَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ that number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that they rejected, they falsified, like they rejected, they called it completely false. What did they say was completely false? Biliqa'il akhirati. The that the fact that there is a meeting in the life of the hereafter. They refuse to believe in the life of the hereafter, and the fact that there will be accountability there, and the fact that they will come face to face before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. That meeting and that standing and that accountability before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they completely rejected that and called it lies. As again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go on to talk about exactly what they said and how they said it. The next thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is, وَأَتْرَفْنَاهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that we allowed them to drown and to become preoccupied with the material things in the life of this world. Now there are two things that I'd like to point, two words that I'd like to comment on here linguistically. The first word is atrafna hum. So of course, atrafna is the fi'al, hum, the attached pronoun, right? Atrafna. So this comes from the root word taraf. And the word at-turfatu refers to, like tuhfatu, at-turfatu, it refers to, and it has a very negative connotation, and it's used in the Qur'an very negatively, mutrafin, mutrafun. And that refers to becoming preoccupied and deluded and obsessed with material things. An obsession with material things. That's what this particular word refers to. The other word is ad-dunya. And so it's very interesting, al hayatu dunya Now normally we know that means the life of this world. Even the word of dunya there's some very interesting commentary about this particular word. The word dunya comes from two, uh, the root of the word dunubun and daniyun. There are like two roots to the word, dunubun and daniyun. Dunub in the Arabic language means for something to be close, for something to be near. And it basically refers to the first life, because it's the immediate life. Then Dani also is another root of the word. Dani, like we say Adana, it refers to something being low. And so dunya refers to the lowly life, that which is less valuable. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, right? He says, Bal tu'thirun al hayata dunya, even though you give preference to this lowly, immediate, temporary life of this world. However, the life of the hereafter is better and longer lasting, everlasting. Right? So this is a little bit of interesting. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of exposes, by even this construction exposes these people, that they became, and Allah says like we allowed them to become. Which means that, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ najdain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened up two paths to people. Now when they decide to choose material things and the temporary um, pleasures of the life of this world over the eternal, meaningful um, gain of the life of the hereafter, then they continue down that path. And it gets to a certain point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets them take the course that they're taking. وَأَتْرَفْنَاهُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ dunya. So they became completely drowned and obsessed and preoccupied with the material things of this lowly, temporary, temporary immediate life. 
So you see how it kind of exposes them. Mahada. Now it's almost like implied here that what did they say? So so far Allah has been describing them. The people, the elite from amongst those people who had all disbelieved, and they were people who rejected the meeting, the standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the life of the year after. And they were people who became completely obsessed with the material things of this temporary lowly life. What did they say? مَا هَذَا إِلَّا بَشَرٌ مِثْلُكُمْ And we've seen this before, that he is not, this is not, again you see that dismissive tone, this is not except for a human being just like the rest of, a, the rest of you. يَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ He eats from what you eat. يَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا تَأْكُلُونَ مِنْهُ He eats from the same things that you eat from. وَيَشْرَبُوا مِمَّا تَشْرَبُونَ And he drinks from what you drink. He drinks from what you drink. Which again is not inaccurate. It's not inaccurate, and this is addressed different places within the Quran. Mali has a Rasul, Yaqulu Ta'am wa Yamshi Filaswak. What's wrong with this messenger? What kind of a messenger is this? He eats food and he walks in the marketplace. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says exactly what's wrong with that. When he talks about Isa alayhi salam and his mother, mother Maryam salamun alayha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kana Yaqulani Ta'am. They used to eat food like normal people. So that's exactly the point. But nevertheless, they had this criticism. But what they failed to understand is that he's not like we talked about previously. Yes, meaning he's in human form. He might bleed. But at the same time, he's not just like the rest of you. Yuha ilay. He receives divine revelation. That's the difference. And it's a huge difference. So he is worthy. He's not worthy of being deified. He's not worthy of being idolized, like being made into an idol or the object of worship. But he is definitely worthy of being listened to and followed and obeyed. He's most definitely worthy of that. And so the Mufassirun here, like Razi and others, they mentioned that there are three things, three attributes, three qualities that are mentioned about these people. Number one is obviously, it starts with kufr. الَّذِينَ kafaru. That denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rights upon an individual, that what does that further do? The second thing is that it leads a person to reject and deny the life of the hereafter. And when a person denies and rejects the life of the hereafter, what is the third stage of this corruption of the heart? That now a person becomes obsessed with material things. Because what else is there to live for? What, is, what else is there to do? And I keep on going back to this, but the Messenger of Allah said, I sit like a slave, I eat like a slave. The Prophet was laying on that straw mat. When Umar ibn Khattab عنه, walked in, and the Prophet sat up, and the mat had left an imprint on his body. It seemed kind of harsh to lay on. And Umar whose eyes became welled up with tears. And he was upset. And he said that these corrupt kings of the world, they lay on these comfortable cushions and beds, while you, Habibu Rabbil Alameen, Sayyidul Awaleen Wal Akhirin, Imamul Anbiya'i Wal Mursaleen, with your status, this is your condition and situation? And the Prophet's response was so profound. He said, oh, Umar, you don't get it yet? Responded with the question, rhetorical question. You don't get it yet? This, is, this was never the focus. This is irrelevant. And so that's the reverse order. But when you disbelieve in Allah, then you have no reason to believe in the life of the hereafter. What's going to prove the life of the hereafter to you once you've rejected and denied Allah's right upon you? And then what else do you have to look forward to but obsessing over material things in the life of this world? In the next ayah, ayah number 34, مِثْلَكُمْ إِنَّكُمْ إِذَا لَخَاسِرُونَ A very brief translation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, um, and you will really be in total loss, 
You will be losers if you obey a mortal, a human like yourselves. So they say, وَلَا إِنْ أَطَعْتُمْ It was translated kind of in the reverse order to just be a little bit more kind of flowing or coherent in English. But in the Arabic language, you have kind of the condition first, and then kind of the, the, the jaza or the outcome of that conditional statement. So you have the, um, the, the condition stated first, and then the outcome or the effect of that. So they said, they continue on with their ranting and raving, they say, وَلَا إِنْ أَطَعْتُمْ بَشَرًا مِثْلَكُمْ That if you end up obeying, إِطَاعَةً means obedience. To obey, to listen to, to follow. To take lead from someone. So if you end up obeying a human being who is just like you, See, and that's what's very fascinating is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exposes their faulty thought process by exposing them here because they keep saying mithlakum. They keep saying mithlakum. Right? Just like the rest of you. Just like the rest of you. Just like the rest of you. And we've already established, yeah, okay, he's a human being, but he's not just like the rest of you. Right? So that right there exposes kind of their incoherent thought process and their, their faulty logic. So if you end up obeying a human being just like the rest of you, innakum, the most definitely, without a doubt, what is the outcome of that? Idan lakhasirun, that you are in that scenario total and absolute losers. Khusran is kind of a new word for us here. The word khusran, khasira, khasara, in the Arabic language, um, you have many different derivatives of this that are used in different contexts. Khusr, khusran. Um, the Qur'an uses both forms, khusr and khusran. That this basically, yadulu ala nuqs. Yadulu ala nuqs. This refers to loss. And uh, some of the ling- uh, scholars of the language, they basically say, al-khasir alladhi dhahaba maluhu wa aqluhu ay khasirahuma. That a true khasid is somebody who not only loses their wealth, but also loses their intelligence, their thought process. That is a true loser. He's lost everything. So they're making such serious accusations that if you end up following, just like a normal person, just like the rest of you, then you are total losers. And again, what is the obstruction here? Is the arrogance. The arrogance and the conceit that again is a result. You can't disconnect the ayat and the progression. That this is a result of overindulgence in material things and obsessing over material things, which Allah tells us, Al-Hakumu Takathur ends up becoming Tafakhurun Bainakum, wa Takathurun Filamwali Walawlad. That just becomes a game of one upping each other. So it basically becomes a culture of arrogance and conceit and pride. Now what ends up happening? Listening to someone else? Somebody else is going to tell me what to do? Absolutely not. Now, now that person doesn't have the ability to be able to humble themselves. Man Allah. That humility, God elevates those people spiritually who humble themselves. And the second part, which is usually attributed as a hadith, is more of an athar, almost like a sharh or an explanation from one of the narrators of the hadith. Then what is the what is the what is the flip side of that? That if you fall into the trap of arrogance and conceit and pride, then those are people that Allah spiritually debases. That they spiritually bottom out. Right? So this is the problem that they had. Haythu adlaltum anfusakum. You would humiliate yourself and let another human being tell you what to do? You're the boss of you. You should decide your own fate. You should decide what you want to do and what you do. Right? So this was kind of their... Um, the problem that they basically had. That then you'll be total losers. But again, based on whose definition? According to their definition. Because following someone and humbling yourself, putting your face, I mean, think about it. When we do sujood, it's very beautiful. We see nothing but beauty in it. The image or even the, the silhouettes of someone doing sujood. It's just such a beautiful image to us. Right? When we see a child doing sujood, that's like the cutest thing ever. It's just beautiful. It captures everything beautiful, the most beautiful thing that we can imagine in life. But did you also think about the fact that, and I've, I've had conversations unfortunately with people who are like, you, would, you put your face on the ground? That's gross. 
What if somebody had like athlete's foot? Right? Toe jam. Right? Somebody finds that to be disgusting. It's a matter of perspective. Right? In ayah number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuing on telling us what these people, what their delusions are. أَيَعِدُكُمْ أَنَّكُمْ إِذَا مِتُّمْ وَكُنْتُمْ تُرَابًا وَعِظَامًا أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرَجُونَ Brief translation, how can he promise you that after you die and become dust and bones, that you will be brought out alive? Right, so this is kind of like a su'al ilzami, kind of uh, like a rhetorical question. أَيَعِدُكُمْ the, uh, the Hamza that it starts with, uh, this is called Hamzatul Istifham. It's an interrogatory um, Hamza, um, a letter that adds, the, it's basically the Arabic, classical Arabic equivalent of a question mark at the end of a sentence. All right? But again, the tone of the question is obviously very skeptical and very sarcastic. So they're asking like a rhetorical question, not literally looking for an answer. And that's part of the problem. أَيَعِدُكُمْ يَعِدُ وَعَدَ يَعِدُ means to promise. Is he promising you? Is he able to promise you? أَنَّكُمْ That you, إِذَا مِتُّمْ once you, will, once you have died, إِذَا pushes it into the future, that when you will die, وَكُنْتُمْ And you have become تُرَابًا Turab refers to dust. وَعِذَامًا We've talked about this word before, it means bones. أَنَّكُمْ مُخْرَجٌ That at that time, that you will be brought out. Mukhrajun ikhraj means to bring something out, to pull something out, to bring something forth. And mukhrajun is the passive noun, the objective noun, the passive participle. Basically means that you will be brought out. You will be extracted from the earth. And of course what they mean by that is brought back to life. Right? Ba'ath. We talked about this concept of ba'ath. Right? Brought back to life. That you'll be brought out again. So they just can't even imagine this. And over here, Ibn Ashur rahimullah ta'ala, one of the mufassirun, he points out something very interesting here. And again, this is to kind of point out how these people are rambling and they're ranting and they're just all over the place. They started off, they started off by first doing what? Attacking the messenger himself, his personality. In Mahada illa basharum mithrukum. He's just a normal person, just like the rest of you. He eats from what you eat. He drinks the way you guys do. What, what? So first they're attacking him personally, personal attack. Now they're attacking what he's saying. Right? So it's like grasping at straws. Anything. To grasp onto anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on to mention in ayah number 36. Hayhata hayhata lima tu'adun. This is remarkable. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they say, Hayhata hayhata lima tu'adun. Alright? Hayhata in the Arabic language. Now I need to kind of explain this particular word here because it is a, a, a very unique word. The word hayhata in the Arabic language, um, there's a lot of discussion about it. Um, Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimullahu ta'ala, he says that Ibn Abbas, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma said, hiya kalimatun lil bu'adi, kannahum qalu ba'idun ma tu'adun. That this is a type of word that means for something to be far-fetched. Al-bu'ad. Kalimatun lil bu'ad, it's a word that refers to something being far-fetched. It's as if they are saying, this is really unfathomable. It's impossible. It is far-fetched. It is nothing but fiction, what you are being promised. Alright? Similarly, um, so that basically, then there's a lot of other commentary from the different um, scholars of the language. Um, it's, but uh, one of the explanations uh, to kind of grammatically comment on this particular word, this word falls in the category of a very unique set of words that is referred to as asma'ul af'al. Or to use the singular, 
so everybody can kind of be on the same page, ismul fi'l. Now that sounds like an oxymoron, right? It's the ism of a fi'l, or it's the ism that is a fi'l. So first day of Qur'an intensive, just completely gone, right? <laughs> it's all been undone and unraveled, right? It's an ism that's a fi'l. It's like, I'm going home, right? <laughs> so how do you exactly explain that? Now understand there are literally, literally, a handful of words like this in the entire language. And there is a remarkable structure, um, an organization to the Arabic language that is one of its features. But again, it's a language at the end of the day. And so it will have its own little unique um, words and little unique things here and there. It'll have its quirks, if you want to look at it that way. And the ismul fi'al, like I said, there's just a handful of them. Suhqan, suhqan. Right? فَبُعْدًا Even though there's a little bit more of an explanation for suhqan or بُعْدًا Amin is usually included within this group of words ismul fi'l That what these types of words are What it means is that They are like an ism Like they can kind of sit by themselves Because we've learned A fi'l requires a doer Right? And sometimes even an object and so on and so forth Right? That these are isms They can kind of sit by themselves they have that element, that rhetorical element of the permanence that isms, nouns, excuse me, nouns have in the Arabic language. But at the same time, the meaning that they create is very verb-like. So heyata heyata almost means like, get out of here. Get out of here, get out of here. So similarly, amin. It's like an ism, but again, the meaning that it kind of creates or it carries is, Oh Allah, accept. Allahumma stajib. Oh Allah, please accept. Right? So that's kind of an explanation of this here. So it's an ism, uh, ismul fi'al, and just to kind of explain some of the different dynamics with it. Heyhata, heyhata lima tu'adun. So these people now basically are saying that, um, get out of here, get out of here. This is so beyond comprehension. Lima tu adun. What you have been told, what you have been promised. That there's a life after death, and there you will face retribution and account- accountability for your actions, and you will be rewarded or punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and on and on and on. This is just nonsense. And why is there repetition here? Again, maybe that's just how belligerent. They were being that Allah is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is communicating to us, giving us an idea of how belligerent they were, how obnoxious they were. You know when somebody just keeps yelling the same thing at you over and over and over again? Just being obnoxious, mindless, right? So maybe that, that's one of the opinions of some of the Mufassirun, that Allah is giving us an impression of how obnoxious they were being. And another um, kind of a nuance that some of the uh, scholars kind of read into this, <coughs> Ibn Arafa, who is one of the very early Mufassirun, who again um, was a master of Balagha, eloquence in the Arabic language, he actually says that um, they're basically referring to two things. That he says that if you listen to him, that if you believe in Allah and you listen to him, that you'll be rewarded. Hey, Hata. And he tells you that since we're not listening to him and believing in him, we'll be punished, heyhata. That one was for the reward, and one was for the punishment. Heyhata, heyhata. I don't care if you're talking about the good stuff or the bad stuff. Heyhata, heyhata, lima tu'adun. All of this is nonsense what he's telling you. So this kind of, Allah shows us the obnoxiousness. And again, you can even tell from the pronunciation of the word in the Arabic language, heyhata, heyhata. It's a very heavy word like that. Even in this pronunciation where it comes off very heavy. So that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, communicates here. Heyhata, heyhata lima tu'adun. Ayah number 37, Allah says, In hiya illa, that what did they go on to say? In hiya, they're still going. In hiya illa hayatuna dunya, namutu wa nahya, wa ma nahnu bi mab'uthin. A very brief translation. There's only the life of this world. We die, we live, but we will never be resurrected. In here, this in is for negation, total negation. Like absolutely, there is nothing. Whenever you negate like absolutely and you use like a pronoun like in here, 
What they're saying is that there is no life illa hayatuna dunya, except for our life of this world. That's very interesting. They didn't say in here illa al hayatu dunya. They said in here illa hayatuna. No, 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 you gotta live life the way we're living it. There's only one way to live life, and that's how we're doing it. There's only one way to party, right? And that's the way we do it. So again, you see that it is, it's exposing these people, how self-centered these people are, and how narrow their existence is. It's quite sad. And then they go on to say, Namutu wa nahya. Now let's see if you can kind of pick up on this. Namutu means we die, nahya means we live. What? We die and we live? Are they, did they just believe? Right? Did they just own up to the fact that we die and then we'll live? Right? So this is answered in a number of ways. Majority, a lot of rather, excuse me, a lot of the Mufassirun say that no, this type of uh, language in the Arabic language, uh, in Arabic itself, classical Arabic, because they didn't say namutu thumma nahya. Right? When Allah talks about it, it says kuntum amwatan fa'ahyinakum. Uh, excuse me, kuntum amwatan fa'ahyakum thumma yumitukum thumma yuhikum thumma ilayhi turja'um fa or thumma, something that shows tartib, that shows sequence. They didn't say namutu wa nahya. That when you use this type of just wow for jama'ah, it basically means some people die, some people live. They, yeah, okay, he talks about death. These prophets, they talk about death. Yeah, okay, so what? Some people die, but some people live too, don't they? And some, some, some of us have died, sure. But some of us are still here, aren't we? So that's what they're basically talking about. Yeah, people die, but people live. Whatever. Who cares? That's one idea. But the other that some of the Mufassirun points out here is that regardless of, of course, they're corrupted in their thought process, and this is very likely what they were saying. But again, what we're able to observe here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and again, maybe this is being used purely from that linguistic perspective that I told you all about earlier, that even translating mot, just as death, is not understanding the full scope of the word mot. Mot means lifelessness. That they said that we weren't alive and now we are alive. We weren't alive and now we are alive. But overall, the first opinion linguistically, and it's used in shi'ar as well, namutu wa nahya. Some live, some die, whatever, who cares, Right? So it's that kind of careless attitude that they have. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ But the one thing that they say that we can tell you for sure is that we will not be resurrected. وَمَا نَحْنُ بِمَبْعُوثِينَ Right? So مَبْعُوث comes from Ba'ath. We talked about this. It means to be resurrected. So they said we most definitely will not be resurrected. And there's a lot of emphasis because it's being negated by the ma. And then that ba that you see, that sila, that preposition of ba that you see on the word mab'uth, that adds even more emphasis. That we most definitely, one thing that will not happen. We might live to see another day, we might die, whatever. But the one thing we can tell you is that we will not be resurrected. In ayah number 38, they say, إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا رَجُلُ نِفْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا وَمَا نَحْنُ لَهُ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ Brief translation, He is just a man making up lies about God. We will never believe, we most definitely will never believe in Him. إِنْ هُوَ Again, you see the same style. That He is nothing but a man, رَجُلٌ A man, we're not done yet. إِفْتَرَى now the word iftara in the Arabic language, it means to make up something, to fabricate something. Now can't that just be called a lie? But iftara refers to not just lying, because you know, you can tell like a little lie or a small lie. Of course in terms of its evil or repercussion, we don't necessarily say it's small or big or whatever. But what I mean by small or big is that saying, saying one lie, Versus now compounding that lie with an entire backstory and all these other details and basically creating an entire um, you know, construct of lies that that's what the word iftira refers to. And the object of iftira is always mentioned with the preposition of ala. Because the word iftira not only means to construct like a whole like web of lies, 
But then usually it also refers to now kind of pinning that on someone else or lying about someone, somebody else. Iftara ala Allahi. That he's just created all these lies. Ala Allahi kadiban. He's falsely attributed all these things. This gigantic, you know, fantasy of his. He just attributed all of it to Allah. Which is very interesting. Right? And again, you kind of see their um, incoherence, right? They're, they're, they're kind of rambling here. That all of a sudden they're very concerned and defensive about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? In huwa illa rajulun iftara ala Allahi kadiman. So what does it, how do we exactly understand this? Because there's um, other places as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of mentions this type of tone where somebody will be disagreeing with the Prophet and disbelieving in the message of the Prophet, but then will make a reference to Allah or will call Allah ar-Rahman. So on one level it tells you, some of the Mufassirun say what that tells us is that maybe they have some loose understanding or belief in the Supreme Being, as I mentioned in a previous session. Right? But they're denying and rejecting maybe some other, other of the issues of belief, like resurrection. Or maybe they're just opposing and disbelieving in the Prophet. Right? Which teaches us the lesson that believing in the Prophet is a requirement of faith and proper belief. And secondly, sometimes... Some of the Mufassirun have also explained, and also we see this in the discourse with the Prophet ﷺ, even in Mecca from the Quraysh, and maybe even we've dealt with it, that sometimes they'll be referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and even refer to Him with His attributes like Ar-Rahman, to be sarcastic. In illa rajulun iftara ala Allahi kadiban. And like when they're saying the name of Allah, they'll be doing quotation marks. Oh, this Allah that He talks about. It's just all a big made up fantasy on his part. وَمَا نَحْنُ لَهُ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ And we will never ever believe in him. We will never ever believe in him, no matter what he says. In ayah number 39, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ رَبِّنْ سُنِّي بِمَا كَذَّبُونَ The Prophet said, رَبِّنْ سُنِّي بِمَا كَذَّبُونَ We've seen this before. My Lord, my Master, help me in response to how these people have rejected me and treated me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we talked about the different meanings of this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 40, قَالَ عَمَّا قَلِيلٍ لَيُصْبِحُنَّ نَادِمِينَ قَالَ عَمَّا قَلِيلٍ Very brief translation. And so God said, soon they will be filled with regret. In a short while they shall most surely become utterly remorseful. So, Amma Qalilin. This basically is the word An. Amma is a, a combination of the word An and Ma. Amma. And An in the Arabic language is used um, even in the Quran and very commonly um, to basically refer to kind of um, after some time or after a certain point. It's in the meaning of almost like after. لَتَرْكَبُنَّ طَبَقًا عَنْ طَبَقٍ That you will go from one phase, after one phase, into another phase. From one life into the next life. Right? عَنْ So the عَنْ here means after. عَمَّا قَلِيلٍ اَيْ زَمَنٍ قَلِيلٍ Right? And whenever, so the قَلِيلٍ is what we call a sifa in attributes. So عَمَّا means after. قَلِيل means a little bit. Now قَلِيلٍ here is a sifa, an adjective. That requires a noun, an ism that's being described, right? The mosuf. The mosuf is not here. It's zamanin qalilin, waqtin qalilin. A little bit of time. A little duration, a little time. Why is the mosuf? Why is the noun not mentioned? Because you're trying to say that it's such a small, short amount of time that you omit the word time. And you just say, just a little. If someone's telling you, come on, come on, come on, you say, you don't, sometimes you get to a point where you're trying to tell them, I'm just coming. Say, just a little, just give me, just give me a minute, a second, just a little, just a little more, just a little, right? So that's kind of the tone of it. Amma qalilin, in a very short amount of time. La yusbihunna, la yusbihunna comes from the word subh, which means the morning. It is a more common word that means they will become. But the meaning of mourning is built into it like before they even realize it. 
Like, you know how you kind of say, like, I just woke up to, I woke up to find this. I have no idea where it came from. I just woke up and just saw it. That they will all of a sudden wake up one day, لَيُسْبِحُنَّ And they will find themselves, all of a sudden, nadimin. This comes from the word nadam, which means regret, remorse. As the Prophet ﷺ taught us, and nadumu tawbah. Regret and remorse is repentance. Just feeling bad about what you've done is a level of repentance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is returning back to Allah. Right? Is fixing your mistake and your, your, your problem, your issue. So, amma qalilin la yusbihunna nadimin. But of course, what is the problem and what is the issue here? That they, Allah describes this in Surah Al-Safat, فَبِعَذَابِنَا يَسْتَعْجِلُونَ فَإِذَا نَزَلَ بِسَاحَتِهِمْ فَسَاءَ صَبَحُ الْمُنْذَرِينَ That they keep saying, bring on the punishment. In Surah Safat, Surah 37, Ayah 176 and 177, Allah says they keep on saying, bring on the punishment, bring on the punishment. But when the punishment reaches the roofs of their homes, then all of a sudden they're like, oh no, we messed up. We made a terrible mistake. We are very mistaken. But as we say, too little, too late. That's too little, too late. And so that's what Allah is saying, that they will become regretful. But it will just be too little, too late. And finally, um, to conclude the passage, I'm sorry, I know I'm a couple of minutes um, past my time. Just to conclude the passage, the last ayah, ayah number 41, Allah says, فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةِ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ بِالْحَقِّ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ غُثَاءً فَبُعْدًا لِلْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ The blast struck them and we swept them away like floating debris, away with, so away with the wrongdoing people. فَأَخَذَتْهُمْ أَخَذَ in the Arabic language means to grab or snatch something. That word in and of itself is very scary. فَأَخَذَتْهُمْ It snatched them. What snatched them? As-sayha. As-sayha comes from saha, yasihu, which means to almost kind of like scream. To scream. As-sayha is like in the noun form, nominal form. And so it means almost like a loud noise, like a boom or an explosion. What is this sayha referring to? There's a number of different opinions. Um, and actually, interestingly, many of the uh, classical and traditional mufassirun, Razi mentions a few opinions, um, the first one is that this is Jibreel alayhi salam. That when Jibreel alayhi salam is sent to destroy the people, he lets out this sound that just obliterates them, destroys them, rips them apart. The second one, uh, it's a narration from Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhum as well, that it was just almost like a boom and then the earth shook. A rajfa. Like almost like such a loud boom that it made the earth shake and it just ripped them apart. And then there are some other opinions that just mean that it's just a general punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us all. فَأَخَذَتُمُ الصَّيْحَ So this loud explosion or boom, you know, snatched them, grabbed them, meaning it took them away. بِالْحَقِّ But then it says بِالْحَقِّ And so what does the word بِالْحَقِّ here mean? It means two things. Mufassirun give two meanings for it. Number one, the obvious meaning, is that a بِالْعَدْلِ مِنَ اللَّهِ and Imam Al-Qurtubi gives the same uh, opinion as well, or ex- uh, excuse me, Ibn Kathir gives the same opinion as well, أَيَسَّحِقُونَ ذَلِكَ مِنَ اللَّهِ That they were deserving of this. This was just. لا يَغْضِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدَ Allah doesn't wrong anyone, in the least bit. And the second opinion of بِالْحَقِّ also means that nothing was gonna stop this punishment. That this punishment was gonna take them completely. All right, and Allah mentions this in Surah Al-Ahqaf, to دَمِّرُوا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِأَمْرِ رَبِّهَا فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ It destroyed everything by the command of Allah to the point where nothing but their empty homes and structures were left. Not a soul remained. And that's the meaning of بِالْحَقِّ according to some of the scholars. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ غُثَاءً Allah says that we made them like غُثَاء. And this is why I kind of explained that Boom, or that punishment ripping them apart. Ghutha'an in the Arabic language is used to basically talk about almost kind of like floating debris. Like little twigs or little, um, just floating debris. 
like almost like little pieces of grass or twigs or some trash kind of floating a little bit on top of the water. That, that's all that remained of them were like bits and pieces. Very, very horrifying, very serious stuff. فَجَعَلْنَهُمْ غُثَاءً And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَبُعْدًا See بُعْدًا here. The word بُعْدًا in the Arabic language means to be far from. Like to be away from. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it, what does it mean? The word rahma, rahma which means mercy, but also has a meaning of nearness. In rahmatullahi qareebun min al muhsineen. The mercy of God is close. Right? But where Allah uses the word bu'ad, He also uses the word like in Surah Hud, the word la'na. La'na is the antonym of rahma. It's to be deprived of the mercy of Allah. So bu'adan is used in an emphatic form. It's what we call maf'ul mutlaq. Like almost like they were completely away from. They were completely deprived from the mercy of Allah. Who? Lil qawmid zalimin. The people who wronged. And who did they wrong? Alladheena zalamu anfusahum. They wronged themselves. Inna shirka la zulmun azim. Again, by not realizing the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, upon them. Uh, I just wanted to, and I'll conclude with this, mention the uh, hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he uses the word guta. The Prophet sallallahu said, Yushaku an tada'a an tada'a alaykum al-umamu kama tada'a al-aklatu ila qasa'atiha. That the Prophet sallallahu said that it is the time, it's very near to where people will feast upon you. Like how food is, like the people eating feast upon or kind of converge upon the tray of food. That people will converge upon you. And they asked, Amin qillatin? Amin qillatin nahnu ya Rasulullah? That it, will it be because we are so few? And the Prophet ﷺ said, La. Bal antum yawma idin kathir. There will be plenty in number. Walakinnakum ghutha'un ka ghutha'is sabil. You will have lost your substance. You will have lost your substance. You'll just be like trash floating around on top of the water. You will have lost your worth and your value. And that worth and that value is in what we're talking about. The book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The following of the example of the Messenger sallallahu And these values that we hold so dearly and that we talk about with such reverence. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of value. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us people of substance. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallam bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta. Nasaqfirku wa natubu ilayk.